Hi guys, we're going to be going over part two, which is pages eight through 16 of Fahrenheit 451. So as usual, let's go ahead and start with some vocab. Uh, we got this first one here, and this comes on our first page that we read. It's page eight. He stood looking up at the ventilator grill in the hall and suddenly remembered that something lay hidden behind the grill. So in case you were having a hard time imagining this, um, here's what a ventilator grill looks like. Um, it is a, it's basically like an air conditioning vent. So um, if you remember, Montag has something hidden in this air conditioning vent that he's like very nervous about other people finding, hence the reason it's hidden. Um, so he's hiding in there, he's hiding some books. It's kind of like very quickly mentioned, but I just wanna make sure you guys got that, that what he's hiding in this ventilator grill, this air conditioning vent in his house is books. We all know how this society feels about books. Uh, next, when he's thinking about Clarice, he says, she was like the eager watcher of a marionette show, anticipating each flicker of an eyelid, each gesture of his hand, each flick of a finger, the moment before it began. So a marionette's just one of those puppets with the little strings and you kind of move them and they move their little arms and legs. Um, so she basically was kind of like watching Montag, like you might watch like a puppeteer ready to move, like, oh, how are they gonna move the puppet next, right? Um, so Clarice is looking for that in Montag. Our next word is mausoleum. So this is when Montag is first getting home um, and the house is kind of cold and dark. So he says, uh, he opened the bedroom door. It was like coming into the cold marbled room of a mausoleum after the moon had set. So we don't see these too much um, in Southern California, but in the South, they're like a really big thing, especially in Louisiana. Um, because fun fact, when you bury things, people, um, and then it floods, those things tend to come out of the ground and you have a bunch of coffins with dead bodies just floating around. Um, so in the South and especially in like areas where flooding happens, these mausoleums are really common. They're kind of like an elevated, it's like a big crypt basically. Um, because if you bury people in flood areas, they turn into zombies. So uh, mausoleum, it's just like a place to store dead bodies. So he's describing his house as cold and kind of like depressing, like a mausoleum might be. Next, seashells. You guys are probably familiar with these. Um, so he's talking about his wife um, sleeping. And in her ears, the little seashells, the thimble radios tamp tight, and an electronic ocean of sound, of music and talk and music and talk coming in, coming in on the shore of her unsleeping mind. And that's on page 10. So this is where Montag's describing how Mildred likes to keep herself kind of at an arm's length away from um, thinking and feeling. So um, she basically has AirPods in at all times. Um, she's become really good at lip reading because she has them in all the time. Um, basically, she just wants that constant distraction. So whenever you think seashells, think AirPods. Um, now he's getting to the part where he's describing what he sees when he gets into the, the room with Mildred. So he says, two moonstones looked up at him and in the light of his small handheld fire, two pale moonstones buried in a creek of clear water over which the life of the world ran, not touching them. So um, imagine Mildred's eyes are just, she's just like laying on her back, looking straight up at the ceiling. She's not sleeping, but she's not awake. Um, her eyes are open and they're kind of glossed over like this, like kind of foggy looking um, because Mildred is not, like I said, she's not sleeping, but she's not awake. She's um, in like a drug induced state. So she's, um, she's kind of like almost like in a coma, but with her eyes open. So uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is literary elements. So these are the parts of writing that make good writing good. Um, and these are strategies that you can use in your own writing that will really help um, engage your reader, get them to take what you're saying seriously and really listen to um, the point you're trying to make. So our first one is repetition and parallelism. They are very, very similar. So it's important to know the difference. Um, so this chart's really helpful. So the rhetorical devices in which repeated words and patterns provide rhythm, enhance ideas, and organize complex passages. Um, think about like your favorite song, how it's not the same beat the whole time, right? Um, that would be a really boring song. There's, uh, you know, there's the chorus, and then there's maybe like a drop, or there's, you know, there's like this like flow of um, tempos and beats and music. Um, so think of things like these rhetorical devices, repetition and parallelism, as kind of like the um, the variety that, that makes things flow, that makes them work well. Um, because if it was just the same sentence length and tone and everything, it would get really boring really fast. So distinguishing between these two. 
Repetition is a rhetorical device that involves the repetition of the same word, phrase, or sentence. So it's the exact same thing over and over, word for word. Parallelism, on the other hand, it juxtaposes two things. Um, so the, the sentence structure is the same, but the words will be different. Uh, so repetition is exact same words. Parallelism is same structure. So um, repetition, think of like repeating the same word. Parallelism means the sentences look the same, but they're not the same sentence. So repetition is the repetition of words, phrases, or clauses. Parallel is the repetition of structure. Repetition focuses more on that specific meaning. Um, and parallelism is looking on that structure, trying to kind of build a tension or uh, have some sort of an effect because the sentence structure is all the same, intentionally so. Um, so let's look at a really good example from this passage or this chapter that shows both parallelism and repetition. So while I'm reading through this, try to think of what's parallelism and what's repetition. Remember, parallel is parallel structure. Repetition is same word. And move myself here so I can see better. So this is right when Mil Montag has realized that Mildred has overdosed, um, which if you weren't exactly sure, we're going to get into that in a second, but that's what's happened. Is Mildred has overdosed, Montag has come home and is like, oh my gosh. Um, he's very obviously very scared because she is like dead-ish. She's not all the way dead, but she's definitely not alive. Um, so this is, uh, again, be looking for repetition and parallelism. As he stood there, the sky over the house screamed, there was a tremendous ripping sound as if two giant hands had torn 10,000 miles of black linen down the seam. Montag was cut in half. He felt his chop chest chopped down and split apart. The jet bombs going over, going over, going over. One, two, one, two, one, two, six of them, nine of them, 12 of them. One and one and one and one and another and another and another. Did all the screaming for him. He opened his mouth and let their shriek come down and out between his bared teeth. The house shook, the flare went out in his hand, the moonstone vanished. He felt his hand plunge towards the telephone. The jets were gone. He felt his lips move, brushing the mouthpiece of the phone. Emergency hospital, a terrible whisper. So, whoo, gives you the chills, right? It's a really um, effectively written passage. So take a second, think. Parallelism, same structure, where did you see that? Repetition, same words, where did you see that? So go ahead and take a second and think about that. Okay, so let's start with repetition because that one's easy. Same words like over and over. So that's really comes when he's looking at the jet bombers, right? So these are planes that are like going overhead. Um, so they're going over, going over, going over. Repetition. One, two, one, two, one, two. Repetition. Um, and then one and one and one and another and another and another. So it's those same words over and over. And he's really trying to emphasize that there's like a lot of these jets going over um, overhead. Uh, so then we have a little bit of parallelism here, six of them, nine of them, 12 of them. So it's not the same words necessarily, but it is, um, the structure is similar. The next part of parallelism comes when he's talking about, um, the sentences that start with the, so the house shook, the flare went out in his hand, the moonstones vanished. So it's just pretty simple sentence of like subject, verb, subject, verb, subject, verb. Um, this one probably could have been, if he just said the flare went out, it would have been more specific, but he says in his hand. Um, so it's not like exact parallelism, but it's pretty close. So um, think about how he uses that to build tension. As this is happening, you're kind of getting like a, this is probably all happening in the space of a few seconds, right? But the way that Bradbury is stretching it out and really building that tension of like things happening, things happening, things happening, things happening. And then finally he gets on the phone. It's like emergency hospital. Um, he's using that, that repetition to kind of get you to buy in and be like, yes, yes, what's going to happen next? Like, tell me. Um, rather than just, you know, saying like, he felt scared and called the emergency hospital, right? He has all this buildup to that, that it gets you as a reader really invested in what's happening. Because you're not really sure. Kind of like, what, why are you telling me about these bomber planes? So the next literary device I want to talk to you about is explicit versus implicit. And this is the part that scholars struggle with this book the very, very most. Um, because Bradbury often writes in an implicit style. So he never like exactly says what's happening. He kind of like describes it and leaves it up to you to interpret. And that can be really, really, really tricky for scholars. Um, because you're kind of like, am I reading this right? What, like, what's going on, right? So he often writes in an implicit style where the plot developments 
are implied through description, but they're never like very clearly explicitly stated. It's like, well, you know, like this, this is the description of what's happening, you know? Um, it might be an example of like, say you're talking about a birthday party, right? Explicit is where you would say they were having a birthday party. Implicit would be something like the balloons were out. There was a cake on the table, a birthday candle uh, glistening in the darkened room. A song broke out from the group and, uh, you know, presents were given. Like it's kind of, you, you read into, you're like, oh, that's a birthday party, right? But it's never explicitly said that it's a birthday party. So implicit refers to something that is implied. So think implicit implied, right? It has that like im um, prefix, but it's not said directly. It's just kind of like, here's what you think might be going on, but it's up to you to interpret that. When someone expresses something implicitly, there is room for confusion. Um, so explicitly, is it refers to something that's stated directly, right? So implicit is like describing the birthday party. Explicit is just saying they were having a birthday party. Um, when someone expresses something explicitly, there's no confusion. So we wonder as a, as a reader, why would an author leave it up to us to figure it out? Why wouldn't he tell us exactly why, what is happening in the story, right? So there must be a reason for that. Um, and as you're reading this, kind of think about why Bradbury might leave so much open for interpretation. Why does he let you do all the work instead of telling you the story he wrote, right? Obviously, the, he wrote a story. Um, but why? Why would he let you figure it out? Um, and there's some really interesting reasons for that. So consider the parallels between this book and our own society. Um, Bradbury may very well have written this in a way that allows you to draw those connections that you might not have been able to if he just said explicitly what was happening. Um, he wants you to kind of connect it to your own life experience. So when, a, when an author leaves that room for you, take it. Like that is such a gift to, to have this book that you can project so much of your own thinking and feeling and experiences into. Um, you wanna take advantage of that because it's not always super often that you get to do that. So making some inferences, like we said, um, when you are given kind of a, a description, it's up to you to figure out what's going on. So thinking about the words of the medical workers, the people that come to pump Mildred's blood and clean it out and get her back to being okay, um, they're suggesting something about the society they live in. Bradbury never sits down and says like, oh, this is the society they live in. This is how things work. He kind of builds that picture for you, but without ever directly explicitly saying what is going on. So, um, you know, the, the medical workers are talking. So they either are people often cheated and swindled. Are people, um, do they have sophisticated machines because of their intelligence? Do they care deeply for one another, especially their spouses? Or that people overdose in this society so often it's commonplace. Take a second and think about that. Okay, so if we think about the words of the medical workers, they definitely don't seem like, um, like very knowledgeable doctors or um, very like, uh, like of an insane intelligence, right? They seem pretty like commonplace guys. Like that's their job, they come pump your blood, move on, right? Um, and they talk about that. They say like, oh, we get a bunch of these in a night. So. Bradbury is basically stating that in this society, it's so common to overdose. Like it's totally just like normal thing. Like that, you call the overdose people and they come and pump your blood and move on, right? Um, so he's giving us insight into their society, but without um, ever ex explicitly stating that. And then finally, here's another one that, um, these are direct quotes. So which one best proves that overdoses are commonplace? A, this machine pumped all the blood from the body and replaced it with fresh blood and serum. B, got to clean them out both ways, said the operator, standing over the silent woman. C, hell, the operator's cigarette moved on his lips. We get these cases nine or 10 a night. D, that's 50 bucks. First, why don't you tell me if she'll be all right? Take a second, which one best proves that overdoses are commonplace? Okay, if you answered C, you were correct. So A does kind of say like that they're, they have a specific machine for this, which they wouldn't make a machine if it wasn't necessary, right? So it kind of proves it, but not, not the best option. 
Uh, gotta clean them out both ways just means that they are taking care of her after an overdose, but it doesn't really show that they're commonplace. And it's not D because even though it seems cheap, we don't know what the, um, like the value of money is in this society. Um, this book was written, I, oh gosh, I believe back in the 50s. I will have to fact check that. So 50 bucks in the 50s was like a pretty decent amount of money. Um, so we don't know if just because it seems cheapish to us, if it's, um, if that shows that it's commonplace, that's not like the best indicator. But this one, they are explicitly stating, we get these cases nine or 10 a night. That is a lot of overdoses. Um, and this is just in the area that these operators work in. So that's the one that best proves that overdoses are commonplace. You will see lots of questions like this on the SAT and ACT, be ready for these. Um, so that is it for section, uh, for part two. I will see you for part three. Uh, thank you guys and uh, good luck on the activities and discussion boards.